So, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Mirko Speretta. I am the director of um, uh, the cybersecurity program at uh, Fairfield uh, University. And um, I want to welcome you to this webinar um, focused on building um, a cybersecurity safe harbor. Uh, this is a topic that, uh, um, a discussion actually that started with the um, bill uh, that was voted in, uh, um, in July uh, in the state of Connecticut. Um, a discussion that um, I had with uh, um, uh, William Roberts, uh, who's gonna be our first speaker today. Um, and uh, so uh, um, William and I um, uh, decided to create this webinar to uh, you know, talk about this, uh, um, uh, this new bill and talk about cyber security um, uh, in general. Uh, so uh, the event is organized by the uh, Fairfield University and by Shitma uh, and Goodwin. Let me uh, tell you a little bit more how the um, webinar is going to um, uh, it, it is going to uh, lay out. Uh, so we will have um, a first presentation from uh, William Roberts, um, and then between three and, and about three thirty, and then we will have uh, I will give a presentation about uh, specifically the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework. And at four, we will have a discussion with the, um, uh, with a panel of experts uh, in cybersecurity. Um, we will have uh, Greg Krishenko, um, who is the CISO at Guardian Life, uh, Eric Monda, who is the uh, senior IT security analyst at Adnet, Justin Hickey, who is the CISO at Fairfield University, and, uh, and William uh, himself. Um, one more thing, you know, about the webinar in general, uh, we, uh, uh, we definitely want to provide, you know, as much information as we can about this bill and about cybersecurity and how to uh, apply and adopt, you know, cybersecurity guidelines in your organization. But we also would like to hear from you. So um, this is very informal. If you have any question, please type them using the Q&A feature in, uh, in Zoom and we will uh, uh, address them um, uh, immediately. Um, so this is the schedule. Um, uh, just a reminder of you know, how the webinar is gonna run. And now I'll turn it to uh, Bill to um, start his presentation. Great, thank you, Mirko, and thank you all for joining us this this afternoon. I've been re reviewing the list of uh, attendees. I think there's actually a few of you who I've worked with or um, in in the in the past on on various matters. So it's nice to be seeing your seeing your names again. So I'm going to share my screen now. Um, what we're going to do at the first part is kind of get the the boring part out of the way, the, the law, all the bad things that could be happening, all of the legal re requirements um, that are um, uh, applicable to local businesses. And then we're gonna move on to the what to do uh, about it phase with Mirko and Eric to talk about kind of how to take some of the legal re um, requirements, some of the legal risks and put that into practice to safeguard your organization. So with that, get this presentation started here. So we're gonna get right in, into things here. The first thing we're going to talk about is what I call the legal landscape, sort of like what is the law, what is the state of the law and what is the state of, the, of, of legal risk regarding cybersecurity? Um, generally for most of you, barely a day goes by without something in the news regarding a breach or a hack um, or some sort of other cybersecurity related incident. 
Um, but I, what I wanted to talk about is sort of what's the law on this topic? Sort of what is the legal landscape? What are the legal risks that these organizations face? And then as Mir Mirko mentioned, we're going to look at two recent changes to state law regarding breaches and regarding a, cyber a new cybersecurity safe harbor. So let's get right into the legal landscape. The most important thing for a business to keep in mind is that everyone has sensitive data. Everyone. Um, I think there's a mindset very often we see with, with clients that if they're not in education or if they're not in defense or not in healthcare or insurance or banking, maybe they don't really have much to be worried about. So, you know, they may say, I make sewing machines, I make shovels. I don't really have much ex exposure here in terms of data privacy or cybersecurity. And that's a myth that I think is slowly uh, eroding away, but one that we certainly wanna lay to rest now. Um, every organization, every business has some data that someone else wants, and that if it falls into the wrong hands may cause real harm to your organizations. Um, so we need to get beyond things like healthcare, records or student records. We want to think about employee data. We want to think about contractor data, those part-time employees, the temp workers, your vendor data. They could be tax ID numbers, social security numbers for in individual solo vendors. And again, we're talking about um, customer data, patient data, student or plan member data, like in the insurance context. Things that aren't personal data, things like trade secrets, proprietary um, corporate data, like financials or, or strategy. And you know, while there is for good reason, a lot of legal focus and a lot of industry focus on protecting personally identifiable data, we can't forget that in a breach or other cybersecurity context, sometimes it's this trade secret data, sometimes it's the strategy data that can be just as damaging to, to your um, business. So, you know, what the kind of the reality that we live in, in today is that pretty much all the data you hold is going to be sensitive to someone. Someone's going to want it and someone could mis, misuse it. And all of that data is at risk of a breach. Uh, so when you have this data, when a business has this employee data, health plan data, any the trade trade secrets, customer data, any of that, kind of what could go wrong? So when we're talking about cybersecurity risk, when we're talking about the legal landscape in cybersecurity, sort of what are we talking about? You know, what as an attorney, um, when you know an attorney comes in for the most part when things go wrong. So what, what do we see in our practice as sort of the things that go wrong for a business in terms of cybersecurity? The easiest one and the one that gets the most press are a data breach, things like ransomware, hacking, phishing. Um, again, like I mentioned a few moments ago, barely a day goes by without some, something of that in the news. You're seeing it a lot now with schools, you're seeing a lot now with attacks on government agencies, et cetera. Um, but there's more to it. There's a lot more to cybersecurity than just preventing the data breach. And there's a lot more to your business's legal risk than merely the ransomware from Russia, for example. Um, the second is company misuse of, of data. This could be something along the lines of one of your business teams. You, misusing data, selling it in a, uh, appropriately, using it in violation of your own policies, you know, kind of like federal trade commission items or the state attorney general with un, un, unfair trade practices. So if you have a, a business that is collecting data from a customer, like, so like a, a direct to consumer business, and you have a, a privacy policy. Your lawyer wrote it, sounds great. It says you're not going to do X, Y, and Z. If one of your team members goes out and does X, Y, or Z, they're going to be cybersecurity uh, and privacy law risk there. Um, the third is employee misconduct or vendor mis misconduct. We see this a lot. Um, and this kind of gets to both the privacy side of, of 
legal risk, but also a cybersecurity side. Kind of what safeguards do you have to prevent these types of things from happening? Employee theft is very common. Whenever, you know, very often when you have a disgruntled employee leaving for a competitor, leaving for some other business, or taking data with them, um, spying on your com competitors, or have your having your com com competitors spy on you, quite common. Blackmailing is actually um, we see quite often as well. This employee miss conduct kind of what are this and I want to be to be thinking about later when we're talking about NIST and some of these other cybersecurity frameworks is sort of what data do I have what are the risks to that data and how could a, a cybersecurity framework a cybersecurity safe harbor like like Mirko and Eric will be talking about how could they reduce the likelihood of some of this misconduct happening and if it does happen, how could it help us identify it and stop it quickly? Um, loss of trade secrets. Um, this is very common in the defense se um, sector or ma in man man manufacturing. Employee whistleblowers. And what I mean by that, that if you are not, if you're collecting, especially personal data, and if you're not treating that data uh, appropriately, if you're not using the data how, as you say you would, if you're disclosing it for inappropriate reasons, like you're selling it to someone when you said you wouldn't, when you're not safeguarding that that data, you do run the risk of particularly a disgruntled employee, particularly one who you're just about to lay off or fire, um, going to an, an a, a attorney to allege improper conduct. Um, it's a great defense against getting fires and it is a risk for a uh, business. And then lastly, customer complaints. So a customer may complain regarding a, a privacy practice to an attorney general or someone similar. So all of these things are some of the risks that kind of brought us to this presentation. Sort of these are the risks that a, a business um, has and then the discussion later we'll be talking about how to address these. So some of the legal implications of these things going wrong. We have lawsuits, lawsuits from customers, from patients. They could be um, breach of con, con a breach of contract claims um, in a business to business context. There could also be a government in investigation. Um, attorneys generals and other are very active in this space. Um, some additional risk, you know, when we talk about a breach or a whistleblower, the, we're not only, I'm primarily just worried about the legal risk, obviously being an attorney, but there's more to it for your business. There's shutdowns, lost productivity. We've had clients who were basically, you know, they're producing shovels, for example, and they're out they're shut down for three days due to ransomware. Remediation costs, you know, bringing in cybersecurity folks to kind of clean up the mess. Dealing with angry customers, dealing with angry employees or patients or students. Loss of a, a contract, that's kind of rare because everyone has breaches. So it's really unusual to see, but if you don't respond to the breach uh, appropriately, your customers may just be gone. You know, they really may. Um, marketing and business development headaches. It's really tough to win new business when your name is associated with a very damaging in, in investigation, for example. And then your insurance costs as well. Um, the more breaches you have, the less cybersecurity you have, the higher up your rates are going to be going. So with that, and you know, I'm gonna checking, I wanna be make sure I'm checking also for four um, questions. So feel free to um, put those into the chat chat box as well. Um, part two, we're going to look at some recent changes to the law. Um, like I mentioned at the top of this session, we're going to be starting off with changes to the breach law. All of you hopefully have breach policies. Um, if you haven't already, now is the time to be up dating those to make the changes that I'll be, be talking about shortly. And then we're going to end this session with the a look at the 
cybersecurity framework in the state and the safe harbor for that. All right. So like every state, um, we've ha we have here a breach notification law that requires businesses to report data breaches. And I have some of the, uh, the technical language on the screen, the screen here. Um, when you have a breach, when a business has a breach, and I'm talking about you know, a business in a very broad sense, it includes schools uh, and other nonprofits, for example. Um, it requires you to provide notice to the affected in individuals and also the attorney general. So since 2006, the law has been pretty narrow. You only have a data breach when you're talking about data in electronic form, so not paper records. For, I've never quite understood why, but if you leave a stack of social security numbers on the CT fast track bus in Hartford, um, that's not a breach. Um, but if you email it to someone, it is a breach. Um, I imagine the AG would like that change at some point, but we'll wait, we'll wait, wait to, to be seen. Um, so it's only electronic form and traditionally up until you know, up until recently, it's only been personal data that's defined here on the screen, social security numbers, driver's license, ID card, credit card, or account numbers with, with um, access code, for example. So it's very, very narrow. Um, that's, that's changing, you know, and it, it has changed on, uh, on October 1st, which really um, a new law was passed, which uh, will we'll go through, really brought the state's data breach law a little further into the modern um, times, because what happened here is that the state had one of the first laws in the country. It was very groundbreaking when it came out in 2006. Um, but up until recently, it's really been left in the dust as one of the weakest laws in the country. So this kind of brings it a little bit more into the norm. Uh, the first thing is it broadens the application. Um, you no longer have to actually do business here. Um, so what the AG is looking for, if you have the, the personal data of a Connecticut resident, but you're a New Mexico company, they want to be hearing about it. Um, the law also shortens the notification period from 90 days to 60. Um, it's still a really long time. <laughs> so, you know, for those of you who may do business in the European Union and are dealing with GDPR, which is 72 hours, 60 days is still pretty long. Um, now, while Eric and the others can certainly attest that, sometimes it's hard to know everything that happens within 60 days in a, a breach, it still is one of the more generous time frames as well. Um, some of the other key changes, the next, I'm sorry, key change here is the expanded definition of personal in, in information. Um, like I talked about just, just um, recently, the, the definition of a breach would only involve the inappropriate use or disclosure of a really narrow set of data, very, very narrow. This law changes that. So this is probably the most important thing aside from the 90 day to 60 day change for your own breach, breach policies and your own breach response program. So here's on the screen, I'm not gonna go through all of it, um, but certain things you really wanna keep in mind here. So like medical records, um, all of you, anyone who's an employer, you have medical data in some capacity, whether it's for the Americans with Disabilities Act, whether it's an employee's medical leave, whether it's um, an absence from work, for example, in those HR files, you have a lot more than just, you know, um, someone's re review and tax documents. So you see you have a lot more here than you may think. Um, so this is the, the new broader definition. Oops, sorry about that. Um, another thing, this is, I put a lot here just because just in case it's relevant for someone here, you know, if you have a breach of login credentials, <clears throat> particularly, excuse me, 
if you're the entity that furnishes the email account. So because we're being sponsored here by Fairfield, I'll pick on them. Um, Fairfield, of course, just like most businesses, they suff, you know, they furnish an email account to employees and staff and faculty and uh, probably students as well. Um, if you furnish that account and you have a breach of login credentials for that account, the state now has very special rules here for you to be following. So if you're that type of business like Fairfield University or Shipman, um, for example, that furnishes an account, you do want to look at this new requirement, see if it applies, um, and also bake that into your breach notification policies. Okay. So the next topic here is the safe harbor. And that's kind of really, you know, the meat of what we're going to be talking about here. So kind of like to, to summarize, we started out with talking about some of the legal risks, you know, all the things that could happen to your data, all those, you know, terrible things, typical lawyer stories, things that, that we deal with. Um, and then we moved on to changes in the breach law. And I wanted to mention that again, because it's important for you to be aware of that so you could keep your, pol your policies current and then you can continue to respond to any sort of breach in a, a compliant manner. But the, all of that comes back to having a good cybersecurity program in the, the first place, because Having a good program will reduce the likelihood of any of those bad things from 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 happening. It's not going to stop them. You know, there's bad breaches happen to good companies, and no company is breach proof, no matter what you do. Um, so, if you know, if, even if we do everything we're going to be talking about, there's still a risk, of course, of a breach of a complaint of, of, of employee mis, misconduct. But at least you're putting in the safeguards in place to reduce that, that risk. And then most importantly, from a legal perspective, from a customer relations perspective, and from a marketing perspective, having a, a cybersecurity program in place when, means that when something bad does happen, you're prepared to respond to it in an appropriate and prompt manner. There's really nothing better for your attorneys that when you're being in, investigated by a government agency or you have a disgruntled um, customer suing you over a cybersecurity matter to say, you know what? Again, bad breaches sometimes happen to good companies. Here's everything we have done. And here's everything you know, that we've done beforehand. And here's um, everything we did during the, the response. And that is, invaluable because it really shows a plaintiff, it really shows the government that you're taking cybersecurity um, seriously and that you know there's really nothing to be seeing here and kind of make those people go away. And there's, all, there's been a lot of confusion about, okay, great, Bill, you're saying I need to go do a cybersecurity framework. You go online, you Google a cybersecurity company, they start throwing some policies around, they start saying things like NIST or high tech or, you know, all this kind of stuff. And you're like, your head's spinning. So what the state wanted to, to do to be helpful for business is to really set forth in the law some standards that your business should think about following and also give an incentive for following those standards. And that's really where we come down now with the safe harbor. So uh, this law came into effect on uh, October 1st. All the de details are here, but really what it means is that if you have a cybersecurity program that meets these framework standards that we're going to cover in a moment, and unless you act grossly Neg negligent, which means just basically you just don't care at all. You don't, you don't even try. Um, a court cannot impose punitive damages um, on your business. So that's really what this the safe harbor does. It's, it gives you some direction for how to implement your cybersecurity program and kind of gives you a, a bit of a carrot to be doing so. I don't think it's a much 
of a carrot <laughs> and it could be a lot stronger, but it's something. So the next two slides here are kind of what we mean by the cybersecurity frameworks. These are the frame frameworks written into the law and Mirko um, is going to spend some time talking about what you see now is the second and third bullet points, the, the NIST standards. These are very technical standards that you need to have a cybersecurity expert to be helping you with, not an attorney. Um, and there's the second one here as well. You'll see some of these, you know, the, the PCI standards for credit card. You see things more familiar ones like HIPAA, Graham Leach Bliley, high tech. Um, so, you know, th these are the standards you want to see. Not all of these make sense for every business, certainly, but at least one of them will cover you. So then if you have this safe harbor, if you go ahead, if you call up Eric and you say, you know what, I need a cybersecurity program. I really want to take advantage of the safe harbor. Which one of these frameworks works for me? You guys figure it out. Let's say it's NIST. Okay, great. We're going to be NIST so what does that mean here? Um, the first thing I mentioned is no punitive damages, which is really a minor thing. So a punitive damage is something uh, as a damage a court imposes to sort of punish really bad uh, behavior. Um, I don't exactly know why the safe harbor relates to punitive damages since punitive damages are incredibly rare in cybersecurity. It's so, you know, I don't exactly, there really isn't a whole lot of practical benefit, <laughs> honestly, to it. So I, but I don't want to focus too much on that. There's actually a lot more benefit to one of these cybersecurity pr um, programs rather than the safe harbors punitive damages provision is a lot more. Um, the first one here is giving some direction. Like I said, so many clients, they struggle because where do I even start? This really gives you under the, the law, a direction to follow. Um, the next is marketing. It is so important to keep in mind that cybersecurity is not just about protecting your business. It's not just about reducing your legal risk. It's also really valuable for marketing and customer relations. And you know, people are very nervous about doing business with someone that involves the transfer of data particularly in the B to, to B side. So what we want you, what you really want, want to do is think about if I'm this com compliant, okay, great, there's a, a cybersecurity reason to do it, there's a legal reason, but you could sell that as well. There are a lot of clients who are very su successful in selling their cybersecurity program. There is business re resilience. You don't have to be shut down for days should s something happen. Um, even if there is something, you know, occurs like a breach of less exposure to government fines or penalties. And when you are sued for something else like breach of con con contract or a negligence matter, it's much, much easier to defend yourself. And you may also have lower in insurance costs. So there's a lot of benefits to this aside from the punitive damages. Now, really quick quick note, um, though, what it doesn't do, the safe harbor doesn't protect you from everything. It doesn't mean that the AG can't come, come after you. It doesn't mean that people can't be suing you, for example, but it is extremely valuable. Um, so with that, I finished a minute early, so I apologize for going a little quick, but I do want to keep us on, on schedule here. And again, um, feel free to jump in with any questions um, either now or later in the program. And with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Mirko. Okay, so um, so for, for my presentation, um, I will talk about, uh, you know, uh, reasons to uh, to use a cybersecurity framework. From, from Bill, we heard about you know, uh, the, the legal aspect and, and also the business aspect. Um, from my point of view, you know, I'm more biased on, on the technical aspect uh, of, uh, you know, of cybersecurity and how that fits into, you know, into your business. So we're gonna look at some reasons of that. Um, we're going to look at uh, uh, specifically the uh, NIST uh, cybersecurity framework. 
um, among uh, you know many frameworks that are available out there. Um, uh, I believe this is the one that uh, um, businesses should uh, should actually start with. And then uh, uh, I will give you you know a brief. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, outline of the programs uh, at Fairfield U um, related to cybersecurity and the collaboration that we have with, uh, um, you know, with the uh, with uh, businesses um, in the area um, between uh, Fairfield University and 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 um, uh, yeah, and, and organization uh, around. So, so why uh, why do we want to um, you know as a, as a business in general how do, why do we want to um, worry about cybersecurity and specifically why don't we want to worry about um, structuring um, and having guidelines to handle security internally. Um, Again, from my point of view, which is uh, you know uh, is very technical, um, uh, technology has a big play into it, um, and the reason is because technology changes and it changes fast, and um, and those kind of changes make a big impact um, on on any business. Um, think about you know um, at the personal level. Think about uh, the uh, evolution of uh, uh, mobile devices. This is a, a visual representation of the memory of the um, iPhone in the first generation. And this is the uh, visual representation of the uh, latest version of, of, uh, of the iPhone. And uh, this happened through a span of about uh, 13 years. Okay, so there are um, important changes on, at the technical level that, that should be considered. And uh, uh, you know, from from this reason, for um, for this reason, we always need to uh, maintain a, uh, a perspective that is up to date uh, about cybersecurity. Um, that means um, always thinking in terms of uh, you know what is the most secure way, like to to store your data today. Um, should you use a technology that is based on, on premises should you use a technology that is based um, on the cloud so you know uh, that is not uh, that you don't have to um, manage and maintain directly um, or for example how do you exchange information today um, do you do that through through email um, or do you exchange information using um, online services? So, um, you know, it's important to, to be um, open to uh, new technology and, and trying to understand how they both fit better for your business and think about how they, uh, they, they also should be um, used or exploited to uh, maintain the um, security of, of your data. So, um, you know, in here, there are, there are many tasks, right? There are the tasks of identifying the technologies. Uh, there, there is a task of uh, um, see how the technology fits in the business, uh, what impact, impact it has, et cetera. So, um, it's uh, you know it it makes sense um, most of the time to have a business unit a business function that is dedicated to that. And uh, I want to give a specific example of of this of you know technology and discussion of technology and how technology impacts the the business and cybersecurity. Um, nowadays we hear a lot uh, the um, expression of digital transformation. Um, and the idea with that is, uh, is that um, a business can adopt new technology and adopt new processes uh, based on new technologies that uh, will improve uh, their business. So the key, you know, the key point here is 
um, adopting a new technology. And this one has as an impact on, on, on your organization. Um, it can have a, you know, a small impact or smaller, I should say, impact. Um, if we think about transformations where um, you are moving your uh, email um, servers online, or you're actually using a cloud-based service like uh, uh, Office 365 or Google Workspace. You know, in those kind of situations, um, you are effectively, uh, you know, moving some of this uh, um, uh, cybersecurity uh, tasks to the cloud, and you are allowing a uh, third party to, to take care of those. But there might be more comprehensive transformation, right? Uh, so, you know, they can involve uh, um, inventory tracking um, uh, in your office. They could involve a, a new customer uh, relationship uh, management software. So, you know, something that can impact not just uh, um, your company internally, but also your, your client as well. Or, you know, if you, uh, uh, if your business <clears throat> is in uh, uh, IT, um, you might, you know, change completely the way you are um, handling the, uh, the back end of your uh, application. And maybe you are using, uh, you're going to use a new middleware, middleware based on APIs. So there is a variety of, of transformations here. And, um, uh, we, you know, with each type of transformation um, and with each uh, new technology that is used, um, there, are, uh, there are implications related to, to, to cybersecurity. And it makes sense that um, these implications are um, managed, handled uh, with, a, a, uh, with a framework, with a cybersecurity framework. So um, I see, you know, this idea of, of the framework to be actually a, um, a potential for, for the growth of, of the business. Um, especially when, the, uh, when you develop a culture, uh, an internal culture of uh, cybersecurity among everyone, uh, all the people uh, working in the organization. Um, and I've seen this, uh, you know, being very effective, especially when uh, um, you know, we foster uh, proactivity towards um, uh, detecting threats, uh, responding to threats, and monitoring uh, uh, threats. Um, the idea here is that um, you know, cyber, um, cyber cyber security awareness and uh, proactivity can really drive the processes um, within the organization to. Uh, to develop uh, effectively uh, your business. And, uh, you know, if uh, that was a little bit of a theoretical discussion, um, of course, there are many statistics that um, really make you think about the importance of, uh, um, of cybersecurity from the, you know, um, from the point of view of securing your um, your data. Um, we know that um, in, uh, in 2020, there were 43% uh, of attacks that were um, targeted just to, to small businesses. And, uh, um, you know, we see this happening as, uh, you know, something that um, hackers try to, uh, try to do. Maybe just... Uh, not because they really want to uh, do any, uh, you know, real damage, but they want to just uh, uh, test out some techniques, hacking techniques, and uh, uh, you know, a, a small business that is no, or an organization that does not use a, uh, you know, a, a, a guidelines for cybersecurity uh, might have a. Um, uh, you know, might, might not be, um, uh, might be very uh, vulnerable. Um, you know, other data that we're seeing is, is related to human error. This is actually one of the, 
main reason, uh, main threats uh, within our organization. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of, say, the majority of the uh, security breaches involve, uh, involve that, involve some, some mistake that was, that was done uh, maybe uh, unintentionally doesn't need to be uh, intentional, intentional, but it actually, you know, uh, created a big problem for for the for the uh, for the business and the organization. Um, and again, um, you know, if we look at in general at other um, uh, problems that that we see uh, are is actually there's phishing um, that. Um, seems to have impacted 75% uh, of the organization worldwide. And another one that is, you know, on the news pretty much um, every week uh, is, is ransomware. And uh, we see the impact of that in the uh, cyber um, insurance claim uh, that were filed in, in 2020. So again, these are all um, uh, other reasons, other you know, more concrete reasons to, to adopt a cybersecurity framework. Um, Bill mentioned about you know, different frameworks that are actually listed um, on the bill that we're discussing today. Um, I would like to start with the, uh, the, the NIST cybersecurity framework. So uh, NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, it is under the Department of Commerce. And <clears throat> uh, I just want to make the distinction between NIST and uh, NIST CSF because uh, NIST is actually the institute and the NIST CS, uh, CSF is the actual framework. Um, this is a... Um, uh, I mean, this work started with the collaboration between, uh, uh, between the government and, uh, and the industry. Um, back in uh, 2014, um, they published the first version um, of, uh, of, uh, of the framework. And uh, there was a major um, update uh, in 2018. 18 uh, with version 1.1. And this is the current version that uh, is actually been, uh, been used. Um, what is it? What is a, a, what is a cybersecurity framework? Um, I would summarize saying that it is pretty much a list of activities. Um, so, you know, a, a set of tasks that uh, everyone should, uh, um, uh, should follow within the organization in order to, uh, to protect the business. So a little bit more in detail and uh, a little bit more, you know, um, information about NIST and how NIST places itself uh, along with other uh, frameworks. Um, the NIST cybersecurity framework is a sort of a self-assessment uh, that can be done by, uh, by anyone. Um, and uh, it's sort of the, the, the foundation of uh, other framework. Um, in the uh, uh, bill that was uh, that passed in July, they also mentioned about the NIST 853, um, which is a much more, um, comprehensive, I should say, uh, framework. Um, well, uh, much more because it's probably um, uh, five to eight times longer uh, than the NIST uh, framework. Um, because it includes uh, uh, basically more activities, more uh, guidelines uh, to, to follow. And uh, if you are compliant with this framework, uh, you are pretty much compliant uh, um, with the FISMA and the FedRAM, which is the, um, and I wanted to highlight this one, um, the Federal Risk and Authorization Management, uh, because this is another um, framework that was uh, um, suggested uh, in the bill. Um, Another important framework that you will see out there um, is the uh, ISO um, uh, 27,000. Um, this is more for organizations that have an international outreach. 
And uh, um, it is actually a subset of the NIST 853. So if you are compliant with the NIST 853, you can actually be, uh, you know, become ISO compliant as well. Okay, um, but let's focus on the uh, NIST um, uh, uh, cybersecurity framework. Um, as I mentioned, we are at version 1.1. This is the one that uh, you know you should look at if you want to start with the, um, uh, you know, if you want to start uh, implementing this uh, in your organization. Um, as I mentioned, there are uh, activities, uh, many activities that are related to, to this. Um, uh, the activities are grouped into five main areas uh, called identify, uh, protect, detect, respond, and uh, recover. So um, to give you an example, a practical example of what this means, uh, let's focus on identify. And um, I would actually like to ask you to uh, participate in a poll that I'm going to launch uh, now. Okay, so I've just launched a poll uh, in, um, in Zoom. These are um, uh, five questions uh, related to either um, uh, devices that you use or services or emails that you have. Um, and, uh, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it basically gives you an idea of uh, the type of question that you might uh, need to uh, answer when going, you know, through the exercise of applying the uh, NIST. So if you can please go ahead and answer those questions. Those questions are, are an anonymous, okay? Um, I would like to see from the audience what, you know, what kind of, Statistics we get. I can see some um, answers coming in. I'm going to give it um, 10 more seconds and then I will close the poll. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna close the poll now. And uh, I'm going to, sh uh, to share the result with you. So the questions were related to, you know, either hardware that you use, how many devices that you use. Um, the majority use uh, uh, of the audience use more than three devices. Um, uh, I mean, own more than three devices. They use on a regular basis, uh, either all of them or most of them. Um, uh, I think the interesting answer is, uh, is uh, you know, is about the question number three. So how many uh, applications do you have on your phone? Um, the majority responded between 20 and 40. Um, uh, but quite a bit of you answer, I'm not sure. Um, and also operating systems. Um, how many of you use the latest version or not the latest version? Um, and then email addresses. So I wanted to do this exercise because uh, as you can see, there is, there is a variety of, of answers, right? So, and this is basically related to your personal data. Maybe you are including devices that you use for work, but it's basically, you know, everything that you use on a, on a daily basis. Imagine that 
this kind of inventory, uh, this kind of question should be done, um, um, you know, should be done for your, uh, for your business, for your organization. Um, this is the first goal of the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework, to identify all, uh, you know, devices, all services that are used uh, within the organization and then, uh, and basically make sure that, um, you know, they are used properly. Uh, they have the latest software, there is no misuse of application, etc. Okay, so I'm going to uh, close the poll, and um, um, and this is what the area of you know identify uh, means. Let's take a look at the next area, protect. Um, and this one has to do with uh, both um, uh, people, so controlling uh, uh, who uh, can access specific network. Um, it has to do uh, with uh, um, software like uh, uh, antivirus uh, that are um, installed on the computers of the of everyone that works in the organization. Um, it has to do with uh, encrypting data, and by encrypting, um, I mean you know both uh, data that you store um, either locally or uh, in the cloud, but also data that is transmitted. So you know if you are sending uh, sensitive data using uh, uh, using an email or using other services, um, you want that data to be encrypted. It also has to deal with uh, backups, uh, backs up, backups of data, not just for the organization overall or for the services that are provided in the organization, but also for all the, uh, for the employees. Um, and it has to do with the training as well. So, um, you know, making sure that everyone um, uh, has the basic skills, the fundamental skills to um, think about, you know, protecting the data, protecting the assets of the, uh, of the business, of the organization, uh, the intellectual property of the organization. Um, and so, and this covered the second area of, uh, uh, of the NIST framework. So I'm not gonna go over all the area, but uh, I did want to, you know, I did want to show you what, um, what, the, what, what it means, what kind of, tasks, activities are required to, um, in order to comply with uh, this kind of framework. Um, so it is, you know, um, an exercise that is uh, um, comprehensive. Um, it involves uh, um, everyone uh, within the organization, um, but it is, uh, uh, it is a very um, important uh, exercise that will help uh, all the internal processes. Um, there are many uh, resources out there that will, um, um, you know, try to help you to uh, apply uh, these uh, frameworks uh, in, in, in your organization. Um, but I wanted to highlight three of them uh, because I think these are the most important one and they have they actually have um, very well curated guidelines on how to um, answer and address all the questions that I was showing earlier. So the first one, of course, is the um, uh, website of NIST uh, itself. Uh, they have a very comprehensive um, description on how to, to use the framework. The second one is the uh, website of the Federal Trade Commission. They actually have a um, section dedicated to uh, the NIST uh, framework for small businesses. And the third one is the National Cybersecurity Alliance, uh, which is a nonprofit organization, um, you know, th that partners with uh, uh, government and, and industry. And uh, um, they actually have on their website a, a program that is called Cyber Secure My Business. And, uh, will, and this one will help you to, you know, uh, again, go through uh, all the tasks required for, uh, for the uh, NIST uh, framework. 
Um, okay, so, um, you know, so far we talk, I, I talked about the NIST framework and I really wanted to give you the um, context and, you know, some um, main points to, to, to start working with it. Um, if you want to create a safe uh, harbor in your organization, this is a great, and, and you don't know where to start, this is a great starting point. Um, I also wanted to mention, uh, you know, as the last topic of my presentation, a couple of uh, programs that we um, offer Fairfield. Um, we have a, a master in cybersecurity. Uh, we also offer a certificate in cybersecurity. Uh, next, uh, starting next year, we will uh, offer an MBA with a concentration of cybersecurity. This is a program that is uh, um, uh, coordinated between the school and uh, the school of business, the Dolan School of Business at uh, Fairfield University, and the School of Engineering. Uh, but I also wanted to mention, uh, you know, potential collaboration that uh, uh, um, that we would like to have with the organization uh, in the area. Um, many of our students go through uh, uh, special courses where they have to basically um, uh, work on a real project, a real life project, and. Um, uh, as an example, uh, some of our students are actually working with the um, Diocese of Bridgeport to implement a, a cybersecurity framework for them. Um, so, you know, keep in mind that there is this opportunity open. Um, and also keep in mind that, uh, you know, if uh, um, you can, uh, I mean, we are open to work with you on a specific task like a vulnerability scan or uh, to do special experiment on software that you either create or you use because we have a cybersecurity lab that is um, dedicated to, um, to these sort of tasks. Okay, so um, this concludes my presentation. And um, if you have questions, please uh, write them in the chat. And then, and now, you know, this brings us to the um, last portion of our seminar, um, which is about, um, which is a panel. So for the um, panel this afternoon, um, we have uh, um, uh, Greg Krishenko, uh, uh, Eric Monda, Justin Hickey, and uh, uh, William Roberts. Um, I will let them introduce themselves. Um, so maybe we can start with uh, um, Eric, just because he's uh, the next one on my uh, gallery here. So that's a reasonable starting point. Uh, hi, my name is Eric Mondas. Nice to meet everyone. Um, I work with Adna Technologies. I've been there for almost 16 years. I've been in the security field um, in different capacities for the past 10 years. Uh, I focus on numerous areas in the security space, uh, primarily though, in reference to incident response. So post a malware outbreak or something to that extent, along with different types of audits and assessments. But I've been around the, the NIST framework and similar frameworks for quite some time. It's nice to meet you all. Thank you, Eric. And then uh, I have uh, Greg, my this. Hey, Marco, thanks. Uh, Greg Kirchenko, I'm a uh, head of security services at Guardian Life, and also I'm an adjunct faculty member at Fairfield University and a couple other universities. Uh, I've been in the security field for over 20 years now. Uh, I've been working in different capacities, uh, currently head up uh, a lot of different functions uh, at, my, at my company, um, mean, meaning security um, operations, incident response, threat and vulnerability management, um, also identity access management, and also um, governance and controls. So, uh, so nice to meet everybody. Thank you, Greg. Uh, next is Justin. Hi, everybody. My name is Justin Hickey. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer here at Fairfield University. 
Uh, we work close with the School of Engineering and with Mirko. And Mirko, this is a great um, event you've put on. I appreciate these types of talks. I think it's very important. Um, I've been IT in uh, IT security for about 20 years doing a variety of different things. Um, but right now we're focused on keeping uh, Fairfield University safe and glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And uh, I guess by now everyone knows uh, Bill, uh, right? Okay, so um, uh, in the panel we have, uh, uh, we're gonna go th through some general questions related to cybersecurity, cybersecurity frameworks, but please, uh, if you have uh, specific questions, uh, put them on the uh, Q&A list and we'll go, we're happy to, to address them. Um, I would actually like to start with that. I see there is a, a first question from Chris and he's asking to what extent uh, do you have to go in order to prove you have adopted a framework? Do you need an audit? So is uh, anyone who would like to start um, with that? Yeah, certainly I could um, jump in. So, and I'm not here to sell anything, but there's always value in an outside third party audit of your cybersecurity framework. Um, I think for good reason, there is often some skepticism um, when an internal I, IT staff claim that they have met a particular standard or a particular framework. Um, sometimes for good reason, of course, a business may not be as self-critical as a third party auditor. So therefore their, de their determinations and their statements may not um, be as credible in the eyes of, of a third party, such as an attorney general, for example, or a, a plaintiff. So I, I do think you probably would want, if you're gonna go through the effort and the expense of complying with, for, let's, for example, the NIST standards, I think having that third party audit, not so much like a, a certification in any way, you know, it should be, um, but in terms of a statement that you do have the policies and the procedures and the processes in place to satisfy each of the, you know, let's say 400 standards of the HIPAA security rule. Um, to serve as a useful defense, I do think you do want that third party to be coming in for that purpose. Um, otherwise you may have difficulty demonstrating in fact that you have a safe harbor, especially more so than on, on just, just paper. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Eric? Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with Bill. Uh, to me, a big component is also your organization. And not all organizations are created equally. Some are much more complex, some are much more simple. Some have advanced technical staff, others don't and they have to outsource everything. And because of that, it could be kind of challenging at times, which I think we'll go into it in some components throughout the different questions that we go through. Um, just even interpreting what certain questions are being asked as part of that framework can be challenging. Like NIST has over a hundred controls. So to be able to know what that actually is asking and how to implement it can be difficult. Uh, so we've seen a lot of organizations kind of do like a best effort on their own and then maybe have like a gap analysis performed where someone will come in and help give guidance along with that type of audit, as Bill mentioned, to help give them the guidance needed to get them through to the end. And I think okay. it's one more oh. thing on that. I think it's important to know too that you know there's different levels of maturity on on the NIST scale, and we we do audits uh, regularly. And it's not you know it's not necessarily pass fail. It's this is the level of maturity you're at today. So what uh, CISOs and people in the security profession strive to do is not that it's impossible to think you're going to check every single one of those boxes, but progress, right? Progress over time, show that you're growing in maturity. Um, to have a, a perfect CMMI score isn't sustainable or practical, um, or, nor does it make business sense. So uh, it's important to keep that in mind. Yeah, and also into to what Justin was saying, it is a journey. So, and you know, you have to go ahead and kind of take a baseline of where you are, and then build upon it. So every year, you know, if, if you're truly focused on cybersecurity and managing risk, 
you're going to keep chipping away at the, the key areas where you need to go ahead and um, you know be comfortable with. Uh, each organization, as Erica mentioned, has its own risk tolerance, and, and no organization is created equal. In this case, you know, risk tolerance may mean different things at different com companies. So, when it comes down to it, you have to understand, you know, what's your senior leadership want you to go ahead and actually achieve, and then you work towards, you know, work towards that to go ahead and achieve it, and then focus on, you know, there's only so much, so many resources, there's only so many dollars that go around. So you have to want to make sure you're getting the the good wins when it comes to what you're going to be uh, putting those those funds to go ahead and actually boost your, your cybersecurity maturity level. Perfect, thank you. And um, um, it, I mean, to, to elaborate on that, do you think that there is a, um, there is a difference between uh, um, companies who need to be, for example, PCI compliant or HIPAA compliant versus uh, organization that really don't have like transaction of, um, uh, money, et, et, et cetera. I mean, can, can those organizations um, get away without an audit, a, a formal audit, third-party audit? I think in, each industry is different. So depending on what industry you're operating in, you want to make sure that you're, you're meeting the actual regulatory requirements that you have for your organization. So if you do have payment, car, you know, payment cards, you want to make sure you're meeting that. If you have HIPAA data, you want to make sure you're you're covering that. If you have GLBA, you want to make sure you're covering that. Also, you know, you have New York DFS, which is the New York Department of Financial Services, um, which also has certain regulations and certain requirements. But the NIST framework is a good framework to be able to, the cybersecurity framework is a good framework to have as a baseline to see where you are. Um, it, you're not going to be able to know what improvements you're able to make if you don't go ahead and actually do your own self-audit. So self-assessing, is never, you're, you're never going to be counted poorly on, on doing a self-assessment because it's really, you know, you taking that action to go ahead and determine how good you're doing or, or where you need uh, to improve on, on your security controls and your, your security organization as a whole. And even when there is no explicit legal requirement to be doing so, there's a couple of, you know, um, reasons you'd want to be doing that. Um, first is what I mentioned in my prior comments that there is value in any sort of legal proceeding, that's first. Second, there's also the importance for guidance to guide your internal I, IT staff, both in the sh sh short term and long term um, budgeting. The third, it actually can be in a way, you know, it's a, you know spending a small amount of money can save you money long, long term because a, a, a competent third party cybersecurity auditor will come in and tell you what you need to spend money on and what you don't need to spend money on. They're going to help you direct your limited dollars to the most high value changes that you can be making. So I think in terms of selling anything to senior leadership, it's a short-term expense with potentially long-term value. And I think you could actually save money by bringing in a, a third party. We've seen that many times. Yeah, and additionally to, to, to Bill's point is, you know, organizations can only take on so much change at once. So a lot of these security transformations or these maturity things you need to make sure that your organization can actually take on the change. You know, I've seen companies that over time have tried to go ahead and meet certain criteria and they, they failed because they try to put in too much at once and you know they, they don't do anything kind of really right so they have to go back and actually redo it so the big thing is making sure to bill's point finding the value add items and really focusing on those and then you know again it's, it's more of a journey rather than just a destination that you're trying to get to Uh, makes sense. Thank you. Um, and since we're talking about uh, about that, the, the you know the implementation of this framework, um, what do you see? What is the main benefit that you have seen um, in either your organization or other organization after a cybersecurity framework was was implemented? Uh, Eric, yeah, go ahead. So there's a lot, um, especially with NIST, but one in particular, not to derail the conversation of another framework, but passed to our neighbors to the north in Massachusetts, uh, was the CMR 17 back in, I think it was March of 2010. 
And that regulation was put in practice in order to protect PI, personal information of residents of that state. Uh, we were working with organizations at the time who were frantically trying to get in compliance. So I talked about like encryption, desktop encryption, a big list of things to do similar to NIST and some of these other frameworks we discussed. And along that way, as you would probably expect, the organization wasn't too happy about it. It was work, time, costs, things like that were, were slowing them down. But shortly after they got fully compliant, I realizing that the state of Massachusetts started hammering down on organizations not being compliant, pretty large fines. Uh, someone actually broke into their facility and talking about what Bill mentioned earlier, and this is not like a financial institution. This was not something that on paper you would think would have a lot of PI, but they had their share, customer data, driver's license, social security and whatnot. Because of the situation, someone broke in, stole probably around 10 or 15 laptops, other pieces of electronic data. When they made their report to the attorney general's office, nothing happened. They actually got commendation for their efforts of putting that pro, uh, the policy, that framework into practice. And as an organization, they felt good about it too. Like, oh, this is why compliance exists to help protect us. We know all of our data on our laptops was encrypted. Anything sensitive from a file perspective was encrypted. So it was work to get there. But when that bad thing happened, they immediately saw the benefit by their hard work because their data was safe. One thing I'll throw out there that I've seen is, uh, seems to loosen up budgets a little bit, right? When you bring somebody in from the outside, it's not just you saying again and again, hey, we need to do uh, X, Y, and Z. You know, when somebody from KPMG or somebody else comes in and, and reinforces that, uh, management understands that, you know, we're not just asking for this to do it and put it on our resumes. We're, we're doing it because it, it's the best way to protect the company. Um, and that's really, you know, the frameworks to me, it, they're just great guidelines, you know, that if you go through that entire framework, um, it may be costly, but you're going to have an, a much more secure environment, um, you know, when you're done and you're never done, unfortunately, I should say. Yeah, in terms of um, picking up on your comment here about being never done, one of the concerns sometimes a senior leader will have is kind of like, you know, you don't want to look beneath the hood type of and 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 argument being like, you know, I think everything's fine. We have two and a half IT people, one of them that knows a little bit about cybersecurity. I really just don't want to know. And right. they often will ask us, is it worse to create this paper trail of negative findings? And that's a valid question. I completely get it, particularly because lawyers so often tell people, don't put, don't put bad things in writing. Um, so why do I want to have a third party to come in and just tear us, tear us apart? Um, so, and I, when, uh, when addressing that issue, and I think, again, a completely valid, um, I think it's important to recognize, to pick up on Justin's comment that it's a, ongoing process that the in some ways the worst thing you could have other than no audit is a perfect one um out of all of the incidents we've we've handled this um, we had one in california where the chain of medical practices said you know oh we have this um hipaa certification like this little sticker they got and it said they're 100 percent HIPAA compliant in every single way, not a single, their risk management plan based upon their audit was nothing. It was blank because they were absolutely perfect, this third party said. Perfect. I was like, really? <laughs> I didn't know that was, was um, possible. Um, that raised more questions with the regulators than it solved, honestly. It really did. Um, it's not about being perfect. It's absolutely not about having this gold star, getting the A plus rating. It's about identifying your weaknesses, identifying your, your, your room for improvement and coming up with a plan to address those. You can't, as has been mentioned, you're not gonna be able to address all of them unless you are the most um, profitable company ever. Um, and you're not gonna be able to do it quickly, but it's about knowing what 
your issues are and how to address those. And that is not seen now, you know, with the exception of some plaintiffs lawyers, um, but it's not seen by the regulators. And I know some are on here, so I don't want to speak for them too much, but in my experience, um, knowledge is not seen as a bad thing. Tr transparency is not seen as a, a, a bad, bad thing. Yes, plaintiff's lawyers will, you know, go off, but it doesn't really go anywhere. Um, plaintiff's lawyers complain about everything. So um, it is important to, you know, to recognize that you're not going again for this gold star, A++, 4.0. You're going for transparency and knowledge. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, uh, so the the bill that we discussed today um, is uh, is focused on you know creating a safe harbor, but the starting point is to basically avoid uh, you know breaches in personal data and restricted uh, information. So. Um, what are the minimum best practices that your organization applies? Uh, for protecting um, this information, um, and you know, are there some guidelines that we can, that you guys would like to uh, share with the with the audience about this? Eric, so I feel like this is an, a really important topic that could be uh, a, a lot of a lot of consideration can be given to it. I'll just mention one thing that I find to be really critical and that I've seen in the field, you have to know where your data is. Um, I've been involved in so many incidents, compromises, breaches, uh, where the organization's like, well, I don't have that data. As you begin investigating, you're like, no, you have 400 social security numbers here, you have this there, you have that there. Uh, we see that quite often where organizations don't have a good grasp on what type of data they have, or even if they do know, like, hey, we know we have social security numbers somewhere, or we have driver's license somewhere, it's scattered in so many different locations that they have a hard time keeping a, a grasp on it and knowing where it is, who's accessing it. So for me, one of the most basic, simple things that you could do is try to have a good understanding of the data you have and where it's stored. Definitely agree with that. Um, anybody else that have some tips to share? Yeah, sure. I'll go. This the, the very similar to to Eric's comment is once you know what data you have and where it is located, um, you want to understand what requirements apply to it. Um, it's amazing how many times um, we get a call from a random car dealership and they say we need a HIPAA compliance program. And I say why. Um, you know, do you have a self-funded benefit plan? No, we get our insurance from Cigna. Like, the, you know, then you don't need, that's not what you what you need. It's not what you need to be spending money on. Um, we saw that a lot with GDPR, the European Union privacy law. A lot of companies wanted a GDPR plan, um, even though they had absolutely zero exposure to GDPR. So you want to really focus your IT spend and you're um, on the require the applicable the requirements applicable to your business and the requirements applicable to your data. Um, so by understanding, as Eric mentioned, what you have, then you could look to be you know more narrow. We saw in one of my slides where it listed all of the frameworks under the the state safe safe harbor law. You need to know which one of those make make sense. If you don't have any car data, who cares about PCI? If you're not a covered entity or business associate under HIPAA, who cares about the High 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 Tech Act? And you know, pressing the pause button to do some of this preliminary work will allow for the cybersecurity work um, to be much more focused and much more uh, appropriate. Okay, um, so. Um, you know, staying in the topic of protecting the data, um, but also using different services. Um, uh, today, um, all organizations basically use some sort of uh, cloud-based service, uh, right? Uh, and, 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 and maybe one of the reasons is that they think that main benefit is that uh, with this approach, um, 
uh, is a third party uh, responsibility to, to uh, protect the data. Um, so in, in that kind of scenario, does, does this mean that the organization does not need to worry about um, cybersecurity anymore? Um, or uh, are there any uh, best practice, practices that should be uh, followed uh, or in that situation as well? Um, Eric? Yeah, to me, this was a really excellent question because it happens often. You see these massive organizations that are really leaders in the cloud space like Amazon, AWS, Microsoft with their Azure and Office 365 platforms. And they kind of build this false sense of security. You're spending this money, you're on their backbone. You think you're receiving this top tier level of security, but and most of these services are a la carte. You get what you pay for. Uh, so what happens is this, uh, organizations invest and move their data to the cloud, which I'm not discouraging. Uh, pretty much every organization needs to have a good cloud strategy these days. But part of that strategy has to be assessing the security and the risk associated with it. And what we've typically have seen is that any compliance, any regulatory uh, components, um, any frameworks equally apply to what is in AWS as to what's in Azure. And there's tons of articles out there that could help organizations to secure them. So there's NIST frameworks that can be implemented for your Azure or AWS workspace. There's CIS frameworks that could be implemented for those spaces. And you'll find that all of them will talk about, hey, you need to have multi-factor. This is not a day and age where you can get away with single authentication. You need to have that. Out of the box though, they're not, enforced, they're not required. You have to go out of your way to do that. Sometimes it requires additional spending, um, but those are things that need to be considered. So I'll just mention that as one, I'm sure others will wanna add on to that. Yeah, I'll just add on that. Um, you know, one of the biggest risks today, and this is you know somewhat new, is misconfigured cloud. And just as Eric said, out of the box, you know, we have, we have a, cloud set up and, and when you get your when you get when you get in you start looking at the settings they, they do kind of default to rather insecure settings so um, you can never by outsourcing I don't think you can ever be free of the risk and, and the work that needs to be done you do have to become an expert on managing whoever is managing that for you though so the, the risk doesn't go away by any means. Also with going to the cloud, it is what's called a shared responsibility model where the cloud provides you the service. It's like the power company. How you want to go ahead and actually use it is on you as, as a customer. So you need to go in with what your expectations are to get out of it. Um, and to Justin's point, definitely there are more less, there's less, uh, less secure setups or less, less an optimal setups that, that are actually there today. But there are technologies out there that you can use that can kind of do some double checking to make sure that you've configured it correctly. So um, those would be solutions that you have to go ahead and purchase as, as an additional add-on. But you know, if you go into the cloud, you know, misconfiguration, multi-factor authentication are probably your two major things that you want to make sure you're you're covering, as well as also logging, because something will go wrong and you want to be able to track it back of what's going on. Um, and then make sure that the access is appropriate for whoever is doing you know access within your cloud or set of clouds or SaaS providers, make sure that the access is tied correctly because you know one uh one misconfiguration on the access side and somebody can actually really, you know, do some pretty, pretty extensive damage on your environment. Yeah, and this, and this oh, go ahead, Eric. Oh, I was just gonna add, I'm glad Greg mentioned that. I'm a huge advocate for auditing and logging. Uh, most organizations have very minimal auditing and um, logging enabled out of the box. Windows by its nature has minimal out of the box. That's one of the huge benefits I personally find with the cloud is that there's much more uh, advanced levels of auditing. Granted, to, to truly get the most out of it, you do need to go out of your way and configure it appropriately. Um, but Bill mentioned this during his initial presentation is that so much with these incidents, you can't prevent a breach. You can't prevent some type of incident from happening. They will happen. It's a no question behind it. But it often comes back to how quickly can you confirm that it happened? How quickly can you then investigate and respond? And you can't really do that clearly if you don't have the appropriate levels of, of logging. You might have sensitive data like we talked about earlier. You know where it is. 
if you have detailed logging and you could prove with absolute certainty that the threat actor or attacker didn't get it, that's a huge win for you from like a breach perspective. If you don't have that, if you don't have good auditing, you don't have good logging, then it becomes very subjective. Legal counsel is going to have to make a guess on their likelihoods and all those other uh, things that need to be considered. So uh, when it comes to the cloud, especially, same with internal though, having a very strong audit uh, policy and log retention policy is super helpful. Yeah, logs and logs and forensics. Absolutely, you gotta you gotta have that. You know, accountability is is crucial. I'm glad to hear we're talking about logs. It's a we all love logs on this board, right? Yeah, it's never it, exciting stuff, but it definitely helps you when you're in a pinch. The most important thing we do is logging. I, I think one of them for sure. And then making sure you're monitoring it for you know what things could go wrong as well. Because even if you're logging, if you're not monitoring, it, it kind of open yourself up because bad things can be happening if you're not looking at the logs. Yeah. Um, so another point that uh, I think we can explore from uh, Greg's comment earlier is the human error, um, because I think is. Uh, not I think is is one of the main threats in cybersecurity, as I mentioned in in my presentation as well. So, how does your uh, organization help um, employees uh, improve their skill uh, skills in recognizing uh, things like phishing scams, um, social engineering, uh, fake websites? Yeah, I'll I'll take that one if that's okay. Um... You, you know, every just about every company out there, I hope, does some kind of annual compliance training for their employees. Uh, I think that's kind of table stakes nowadays. But above and beyond that, you, you have to test your employees. Um, they're not going to love you for it, but you have to send out, you have to set up a fake phishing system. You have to fish them regularly. Um, you have to be able to kind of pull up a report card on each of the users, each of the employees showing how they've done over the years. And I think most importantly, though, you, you have to take kind of a kinder, kinder, gentler approach to to training, right? And when when some of these people fail, you know, a couple um, phishing tests, or they they pick up the USB drive that you planted and, and plugged it into their computer, they're going to be a bit defensive, and you know that's that's a, you know that's understandable. We try to have like a kinder, gentler approach. Look, you're not in trouble. Um, we're glad that we've helped identify this weakness. Let's work on it. Um, the days of kind of you know getting angry or, or shaming people for for failing these things are over, and I'd say the biggest reason is because these people can become your biggest strength. Um, we've had people, and it's people you would never think would fall for things. You know, they, they, some of the most intelligent people you know they can be tricked. They're busy. Um, what we try to teach them is slow down. Uh, you know, examine each of these uh, messages, each of these threats. And, and just think about it. Everyone is so busy, they're ripping through things. And that's why phishing is so successful because people have, have so much mail, they're trying to get through it all. Um, so we've successfully turned some of our, our biggest offenders into our biggest um, heroes, right? I'll say, or our biggest, you know, they're out there spreading our word now, which, which is good. Um, so you, you really have to take that into account. You have to uh, consistently test your employees to make sure they're up to the job. And if they're not, you have to give them the training uh, to get them where they need to be. Yeah, and on top of that, what Justin was mentioned is also find your internal champions. Uh, you know, the people that, to your to Justin's point, that you would never think would be an actual champion, really can go ahead and help, uh, really cascade the message down of how important security truly is. Uh, another big thing that we've, we've also seen over time is making sure people are aware. So having things like, you know, a security champions program or, or things where you're starting things that are grassroots, make, get people talking about it really goes in and helps. Social media has been a great thing. I've seen in, in cases where we might do a USB stick drop or a phishing test and some of our early career folks or even some of our, our, our security champions might actually alert the entire organization of it. And as and it's it's a great thing to actually see that you know the human factor of crowdsourcing information and, and finding things that maybe you know seem a little bit off and, and getting people's guard up really goes and actually helps benefit in that in that scenario. So I, th I think as you can find the, the the personal aspects of it, it can really make sure that it actually helps benefit your organization. Yeah, and then to to just add to Justin and Greg's comments, I'm a huge fan of that. I love how you mentioned that, Justin, about the commend. 
we've seen many organizations where they shame their employees. And because of that, they hide doing what they shouldn't. Not purposely, but they click that link and they feel bad, but they're not going to report it because they don't want to be in trouble for doing something accidentally. That leads to a lot of bad situations. But that, uh, to me, is really helpful for like the end users, the security awareness training, the phishing, all those recurring PSAs. Hey, there's this type of event going on. There's this new type of threat that's emerging. Please be careful about these types of emails. Uh, but even on the technical side, uh, there's a lot of benefits that can be done because human error, you think of depending on the size of your organization, if you do have like an IT team, maybe if it's even small, implementing simple things like change control, where before a change is made, a request has to be submitted, has to be reviewed by a peer to make sure like, well, why are we making this change? Is it really needed? What are the um, potential impacts by implementing such a change? And then if you have even the possibility of auditing such changes after the fact, you know, NIST and these other frameworks recommend regular risk assessments, and that's great, but there's a lot that could happen between your annual risk assessment that if you're able to implement controls internally to kind of help spot check human error, that can go a long way as well. Um, great. So, um, in, does this, uh, um, are these also guidelines uh, to, to sort of prevent um, or prepare your organization for, for new threats? And um, uh, do you have other suggestions to, to do that? How can an organization, you know, prepare themselves to, to, to new threats, to new malicious attacks um, or like, or ransomwares, for example, um, is, or is the safe harbor a, a tool that can help companies with that? I'll, I'll, I'll start on that. I th you know, so in most instances, the cybersecurity frameworks mentioned by the safe harbor law will include some component of incident management and incident response. And that's really where I would start on the non-cybersecurity side, um, the, the non-technical side, because your employees, um, they need to know what to do quickly when they click, when they inevitably click on, when they fall for a phishing scam. When, they, when that happens, they need to know what to do. You want something on your desk, on their desktop or something to say, should something happen, you contact security at so-and-so. You call this, this number. And you want people to feel safe doing that. Um, there it sometimes can be a tendency among HR departments to um, enforce rules very strictly, um, and in my mind, very counterproductively. We don't want to punish people for clicking on a phishing link. We don't want to punish someone for um, falling for inadvertently allowing a ransomware to occur. There are times and places for punishment. There's plenty of bad actors out there. There's plenty of insider threats, but the falling for sophisticated phishing link is not one of them. We want people to feel safe that when they report this, HR won't be knocking on their door. Um, we want to make it as um, seamless as possible. We want to make sure that they can do it when they're at work. We want to make sure they can do it when they're at home, when they're on vacation in a foreign country, when they're on you know, vacation in Finland in a very different time time zone that someone back at the company will be checking those reports, that it will go to a, dis, a dis, distribution list. So we know people aren't on leave. We know people who aren't sleeping, for example. Um, that is the, the first step of it. And then the second step, again, which these frameworks will help, help you with, but so much of it is your internal business is taking the framework and applying it is who's in charge, knowing your team is vital, um, knowing who at your company is going to be in charge of an, an incident, knowing who to be calling, knowing who your uh, attorney is, knowing who, if you have cyber security insurance, knowing who to contact there and when, um, having a relationship with an outside IT or forensic firm is very important as well. This isn't the time to start interviews, for example. 
So encourage people to be open about these things, give them the tools to report them quickly, ensure that the reports are taken in promptly and ensure that there's a team on standby ready to go um, and knowing who, the, who your support is. Um, and that those are um, key points that carry through any of these frameworks and that will allow you to start on day zero um, to have a, a timely and appropriate response to even the, the most devastating of, of events. Yeah, one, one thing I have what Bill just mentioned is, you know, looking at testing your plan and testing it regularly. So you might look at things like a tabletop or a war game where you bring up a certain scenario or attack scenario and you're exercising your plan to see how you would respond. And then the best way to go ahead and actually test out your plan is when you're not under crisis. So if you have the ability to go ahead and actually test, test yourself out in advance by bringing another part, third party or even just having people sit down around the table and kind of say, this happens, what would you do next um, to just test out how, how that plan would operate? You can find potential gaps in your plan by just doing a, doing a walkthrough and, and having, that, having that done in, in a more you know, non, non-threatening type of way, making sure that people don't feel like they're on the defensive if something gets missed. You'd rather go ahead and be putting your plan together, be able to actually execute your plan to perfection when the actual the actual event does go ahead and actually occur because it's not more of if it's more when it's going to be there you want to make sure you're prepared for that yeah exactly and the thing i would like to add miracle you asked a question about ransomware that's a huge buzzword everyone's concerned about getting ransomware um to me a huge advocate we've highlighted it numerous times throughout this panel and even at the presentations beforehand there's no way to be 100 percent void of any type of malicious attack. At some point, an incident will occur, it's inevitable. There's a lot of good things you could do to help prepare, prepare your response times, your detection times, things like that. But just speaking of experience from incident uh, situations I've been involved with, talking about the benefit of implementing um, a framework like NIST, uh, over the past three months, there's probably been five or six uh, incidents associated with ransomware I've been involved with. Every single one was associated with a vulnerability to a system that patches were released back in March and April. If you and your network followed a framework like NIST that talks about having regular patching, regular vulnerability management, trying your best to stay on top of it, you know, we're not talking about these like nation state attackers trying to break in through your front doors. You know, that happens, right? We heard about solar winds and some other things where those big supply chain attacks do occur. If that happens, sorry, there's nothing anyone can do about it. But a lot of the things you hear about in the news about these schools and local municipalities and businesses, a lot of times when they get these ransomware events, it's like low hanging fruit. If they just performed a reasonable uh, framework like NIST, in many situations, the possibility of that attack happening would be greatly mitigated. Again, the past five or six that I've been involved with during the past two months, if they followed NIST to a reasonable degree, again, as Justin mentioned, not perfect, but we're on that journey, odds are they never would have experienced these ransomware events. It's, these frameworks do help many ways of mitigating your risk and impact from these types of attacks. And a lot of it, like you're saying, Eric, is foundational stuff. You have to be able to be to patch all of your systems quickly. And if everybody had all their systems patched quickly, there'd be a lot less ransomware. I think you're right on. You miss, you miss the municipalities and uh, small businesses that are getting hit, they're low hanging fruit. They just don't have the resources to, to build you know, a cybersecurity framework um, or they just haven't had the time. But yeah, so much of this would be, would be a non-issue if, if everyone patched their machines in a timely manner, had a, had a plan, you know, and a deployment system that could uh, push out patches in a matter of minutes, not hours or days. Um, I think great insights um, about, you know, what, what uh, each organization should do. Um, so let me ask, uh, I'm, I'm going to switch gear, and uh, uh, but I want to ask one last question. Um, about uh, cybersecurity insurance, um, uh, I think you know organization would be interested to know um, about you know uh, having um, cybersecurity liability insurance. Um, 
should should all organizations have that um, or not? I'll I'll start um, with that. I think you need to have a really good reason not to have it, honestly. Um, but the important, the, just as as equally important, is ensuring the type of policy you have. You know, um, I look at a lot of these policies, and we always say, you know, Swiss is bliss, but cheddar is best. And um, it's amazing how poor some cybersecurity policies are. I mean, the holes are just enormous. I mean, we had one recently where an insurer denied coverage because our client purchased a cybersecurity policy that excluded criminal acts. And it's like, well, what kind of breach would there be that's not a criminal? <laughs> I mean, like, what are you talking about? Um, but it was a really cheap policy. It was very, very basic. Um, and we see things like that, Eric mentioned the solar winds um, and, and, and nation state actors. Um, sometimes policies exclude breaches carried out by a nation state, um, which I mean, so there's a, there's a, so the short answer of this is yes, but make, you know, really spend the time finding the appropriate broker and don't just buy an off the shelf policy. The market for cyber insurance, in my view, is not nearly as mature as what you would have you know, for auto or home or life. The insurers simply don't have a great grasp on the metrics, given, which is completely understandable given the incredible variation in costs, given the constantly evolving threat and environment. It's very difficult to price out policies and produce policies with um, data that you just don't have consistent figures for. So find the right broker, spend some time finding the right policy. Don't be afraid to review the policy. Uh, don't be afraid to negotiate the policy. Really not. I know you probably are thinking negotiate insurance. I would never call up, up State Farm to negotiate. You know, the fine print in my auto and I'm just looking for the cheapest one or something. But with but cyber is really different. Um, again, it's not like life insurance or homeowners insurance. It um, is much more customized. Um, it varies much more in quality and coverage. So you wanna you know, spend some time looking through the ex exclusions and negotiate it. Really, you want to negotiate. If you're a large enough organization, um, the insurer will work with you because they're not out to, you know they're out to to sell the policy and they want to sell a policy that's going to be uh, appropriate so it's a long-winded answer of yes but be careful yeah i would just add on there um, cyber insurance has not been very profitable for the past five years for cyber insurance holders or or businesses and it's becoming almost difficult to get um if you have cyber insurance ask yourself do you have enough and, um, you know, another point I'd like to make is another benefit of cyber insurance is if you ask for enough, they're going to ask you to meet certain standards. So it's almost like a framework among, uh, amongst itself, right? They will, they will check you, you know, make sure you have the components of a NIST framework in place before they will insure you. I think that's kind of the future. They're going to start uh, assessing you as you do this. And one last thing I'll say, um, test your cyber insurance, call them, file a claim and see if they're living up to their uh, SLAs and their agreements, because you might be surprised, you know, how often are you going to actually file a claim, right? It's important to file a claim and make sure you're comfortable with that process. Yeah, I'll just um, chime in. It, it, you know, it's not unheard of in, in my world for a client to call their cyber insurance during uh, ransomware and not hear back for three or four days. Um, and by that point, the insurance is pretty much worthless because you can't wait that long. <laughs> you know, you need to go out and get get things started. So you know, you want to be be looking at that. And also, to the point about cost, I, one of my slides I mentioned the value of the frameworks aside from this, the safe harbor is exactly what was just mentioned by Justin. 
And these frameworks can lead to cheaper insurance costs. They want to ensure, it's like, you know, think about back to auto. They want to ensure this safe driver. They want to ensure the person who drives the speed limit. These companies want to ensure the companies that are NIST frame, that are NIST compliant and HIPAA compliant. Um, so your premiums will be better. Your, um, your retention particularly will be better. And so you want to watch that as well. Some of these policies come with really high retentions, almost making them useless, except for on like a, a bet the, the company kind of event. Um, so a lot of those, of those things. But you know, the framework here is valuable to lower your costs and actually get coverage. And just one thing to add, it's in harmony with what was just previously mentioned. We've seen two organizations within the past few months that did experience ransomware events, did not follow any framework, did not have really strong security practices prior uh, when their coverage lapsed, uh, the insurance provider would not uh, renew it unless they proved uh, evidence that they performed a level of security work like risk um, assessment, pen test. It was a big list of things that they needed to do. And not to mention the premium kind of skyrocketed after that. But it highlights the point. All of these are standardized components of these frameworks like NIST, CIS, ISO. So if you're doing those already and you're looking to renew insurance costs for going up, you're already going to be ahead of the game from that perspective. Hopefully lower premiums, better coverage. Um, so that's, you know, it's that win-win. Yeah. And to the point of cyber insurance getting more mature than, than what they've been in the past, they're definitely doing more deep dive into what your organization is capable of doing. You know, where are you from a maturity standpoint? What, what controls do you have in place? How are you doing there? They'll also go ahead and look to see you know, what, what capabilities that, that you have that can potentially help withstand kind of something like a ransomware or denial of service attack. Um, and one of the other things that, that we've seen you know, is just that it continues to, to increase from a cost perspective. I think what I've seen and speaking with some of the brokers is, you know, the costs, if you already have an existing policy, have doubled year over year because of all the losses that have, that have been ensued by, by, from a cyber insurance perspective. And if you do actually experience cyber insurance, as Bill was mentioning, you may also think about having a, a broker who contacted the bad actor. Um, they, they will actually do kind of conversations with the bad actor to try to negotiate that um, while you're, you're working on getting paid for, um, paid by the cyber insurance company to have the money later. But there are companies out there that, that can go ahead and actually help you know negotiate with the bad actor when something does go ahead and happen uh, if you're looking to do that there's also things that are happening from a government standpoint that says if you pay a bad actor and it's in an OFAC country um, you may actually be subject to sanctions or, or uh, financial penalties so you have to be careful of who you're dealing with and some of these brokers from a from a bad actor perspective negotiating on ransomware they can they can send some of those things and that's where sometimes you may get the authorities involved to help you make the right decision Okay, um, thank you everyone. Um, I think uh, that uh, we are um, we are done with the um, the panel. Um, and uh, so I, I would like to thank uh, the audience uh, for joining joining the the, the, the webinar. Um, I am going to uh, start a quick uh, three question survey um, to you know get your feedbacks on um, uh, to get your uh, feedback about about the webinar. I would also like to thank very much all the panelists um, and uh, their really uh, valuable uh, insights, um, not just about the you know safe harbor and the bill, but about um, uh, a lot of the tips uh, uh, related to, to, to cybersecurity. So uh, thank you everyone and uh, um, enjoy the rest of your night.